Welcome back to another episode of What's Up Prof. As you see, today we are turning the tables. I'm doing the introduction because my young friend Martin is going to give his testimony. We finally twisted his arm and got him to relinquish his resistance. So Martin, are you ready? Yes, let's go. <laughs> let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is always a privilege to hear how people find you. And I pray that it will serve as an incentive for others to seek you too and to find you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Martin, today you are trapped and you cannot get away with it any longer. <laughs> so you will have to tell us about your story and how you came to believe what you now believe and how long ago was it? Well, I grew up on a farm. My parents divorced when I was about six years old. Then we stayed with my father and on the farm, his brother, my uncle and my grandparents. So we act I grew up in this very loving family on the farm and we had a good relationship with my mother as well. And we are never actually, at, when I was small, young, we never went to church. Um, we were, the, my uh, grandparents were believers, especially my grandmother. But my grandfather and my father and my uncle were not um, church going. They had their reasons. And my mother was quite religious. She was the one that continually, when we went to visit her, she would take us to church or she would uh, always give us nice Bible songs or buy us books that we can study, the biblical um, stories and so on. And when I was about 10 years old, um, my mother started coming through to where we were on the farm and took us then that we could go every Sunday to church. We went to different churches. She was not in the she was in the more charismatic churches. And so we went to that. And then eventually my father said no, we should attend the catechism classes of the Presbyterian churches in okay. Afrikaans the Enghia church. Yeah. And the school had a hostel. And the hostel children also went at uh, this catechism classes and that was during the week so we started attending those because my father and them never went to church on Sunday I now, used you were conservative but mm -hmm. your father never went to church no so my father never drank or smoked or anything did like he, that did he speak religion in the home at all no 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 so he just had good moral values but he wasn't a church going man yes he was a strict uh, man when we grew up, but we, he was, what he, when he talked, we listened. We didn't get hidings that much because I can remember probably, I think, twice or three times that he actually hit us. Yeah. The rest of the time, we actually obeyed when he was talking, and he let us, well, well because we were three t uh, brothers, there was a lot of fighting <laughs> going on, and he just let us go until it got to a, such a stage that it, maybe he saw, okay, he has to say something that he would have just said he must either lo rather love each other than fight the whole time, uh, something like that. So we, it was a very loving environment that we grew up in. And when I say conservative, I'll, it's like uh, not in fashion, that type of thing. We went to school. I used to uh, wear clothes that you could see I'm a farm boy <laughs> mm -hmm. um, in South Africa. I don't know if it's other countries as well. You call it safari pucker. Uh -huh. uh, it's, a, it's a special little suit. Yeah. Yes. And I, w I would have wore that. That was actually our school uniform up until I was about, I think, 10 years old. And then also after that, I w wore long socks and stuff like when the children. Uh, so my, I wasn't very, 
we weren't very uh, worried about fashion, if, if, I can, if I express myself correctly. Um, and then also when I got to high school, CD players actually came out. So, and I was getting very big into music. I loved listening to music and that also started another love that we'll get to on later. And music played a big role in my life. I, there was, uh, especially through high school, and I'm sure that a lot of people can resonate with that. Um, I even apply memories to the types of songs that were th at that stage. And what was your favorite yeah. genre? I had a very big um, right. range. Okay. From classical and opera to... Uh, at, uh, I, I was quite conservative up until the stage. I was very conservative. I never used to listen to rock music or to heavy metal or s that type of things. But that was in, uh, when I was younger. But in uh, about middle high school, 15, 16 years old, I didn't as much listen to rock music, but I started listening to l a lot of techno type of music. I also got to be religious because we were like i said earlier we were going to church on sundays and we had um, catechism classes on tuesdays and then we also started going to youth fests me and my friends and i enjoyed it very much but this was there was this dual life almost there was the this religious life that i and very conservative and then i also started experimenting like for instance with alcohol at 15, 16 years old, but I didn't drink that much. It was just every now and then we would have a party or so. Then me and my friend, we decided, no, we wanted to be rich. And we looked at some jobs that were available and that people made a lot of money in. So we decided, okay, we'll become chartered accountants. That looked good. And we, I really enjoyed accounting and so on. Things didn't actually work out as we planned. And my friend went on to the university um, of, in, in, in Pretoria. And I had to go and work and study through UNISA. That's a um, distant learning university. Distant learning university. And then my life changed drastically because I wasn't in the restricted and conservative milieu of how I grew up. And it was quite easy to get alcohol and parties was nice. And I was also always an outgoing person. I, I loved having parties, even though we didn't always... And in school, like I said, we started having parties, dance parties when I was 10 years old already, me and my friends. I loved dancing. So we would have, now not the dancing like most people are probably used to, but if you grow Like up, the typical long arm dancing. Yes. Okay, yes. You, right. you know, I don't know if the viewers will always, everybody know it. It's not, you stand, the stand and uh, uh, you yeah. it's going around and dancing. Yeah. So you see, perhaps I must just tell the viewers that you grew up in a very Afrikaans environment yes. and uh, English is not your first language. No, that's why I'm struggling, sorry. <laughs> and that doesn't matter. We went the story. And also, you grew up in that culture. Mm. Now, I never grew up in that culture. I grew up in a very German or a very english orientated culture and not in an Afrikaans culture. So the type of dancing that you're referring to the first time I was confronted with that kind of dancing is when I got to the university. I went to an Afrikaans uh -huh. university. And I thought, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, you know, more in the rock and roll yeah, scene. And uh, the music I listened to was moody blues yeah. and uh, all of those. Well, the Moody Blues were my favorites, but I didn't mind things like the Rolling Stones. I was never a Beatle fan or anything <laughs> like that, but uh, more sort of the spiritual weird music. Mm. 
which is actually, you know, very demonic. Yeah, yeah. And then I got to university and they had this, this long arm dancing <laughs> and, you know, my feet just wouldn't do anything <laughs> like that. So this is what you grew up with. So I know exactly what you're talking yeah. about. It's like barn dancing. Yeah. You can actually call it. Yeah, it's like a kind of barn, barn dancing. dancing. Yeah. And we always went to that. So that's how I grew up. And I, when now, when, after I got to live in the city and had all this freedom, the dancing changed a bit. Uh -huh. Because now the scenery changed and I started going to clubs. And at this stage, I was drinking uh, every weekend. We were having parties every weekend and so on. This is now just after school. So, needless to say, my studying also uh, took a little bit longer than normal. And it should have, yes. <laughs> yes, so uh, a three-year course got into a, well, let's just say, I could always be considered as a career student at that stage. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, but um, in the back of my mind, I still, I was still religious. I had a love for Jesus, but my life didn't show it at all. And then that was up until about 2000, well, let's say that was the first three years of after school and then it even got a little bit worse because the clubs that I used to go to I was just around and we were having a good time but then I started to go to like rave parties and I was I really like I mentioned earlier I already started liking the techno type music when I was very young, about 12 years old, 13 years old. And now, with the type of music, I really enjoyed uh, th that type of music. So it became a big part of my life. Did I, you partake in the drug scene there? Yeah, well, it comes with the whole. It comes with a package. It deal. comes with it. You know, there's a problem with it. Because if you mention the word drugs, it sounds oh. But when you when you're there, you never talk about it like drugs. There's no not that stigma to it. And then all of a sudden, it's not that bad. If you understand, I'm not I'm not saying it's not bad. But when you're there, it's, it's totally different. And we had. I can say I, we enjoyed our, uh, our time, our life. Or maybe we thought we, we enjoyed it. The reason being, you never had any worries. That's, that's actually one of the mottos. That, there, was two, there were two motto, mottos that we went by. Music is my life and no worries. Because it was weekend to weekend. You had Friday evening... You had a you knock off work. Half past ten at the evening, the party starts at the club. You go right through. The club closes probably at seven o'clock the next morning. Then you go back home. You continue your partying. Saturday evening, maybe if you're tired, you go to sleep. Otherwise, Sunday morning you go. So you go right through till then, and then you recoup. <laughs> <laughs> up until Tuesday, so the first two days at work is not that great for the boss, <laughs> but he never knew it. And then by Thursday, Friday, you're back at it again. That was my life for about five years. Then I met a girl who knocked my feet out from under you. Yes. And I actually met her on, on, the, on a beach New Year's party. She was the friend of my best friend's sister. And we had a good time, but then nothing Nothing much, materialized. No, nothing materialized. That was the, like I said, December. The next year, she actually invited me out of the blue to go to her 
school farewell. So I went, but nothing, nothing materialized, materialized again. again. So the next year, she asked me to maybe, at this stage, I was, I must maybe just mention this, I was a DJ. So weekends you were a DJ. Yes. Well, yeah. but th now I have to qualify this because I was a DJ in the barn dancing scene, but I was also a DJ in the trance techno rave scene. So she didn't know that part. She knew I was a DJ for the barn dancing, and she, she invited me to play for her sister's 21st birthday. And I decided, okay, but this time she's not going to get away. So I asked my brother to come and help so he could do the music and I could sort this thing out that it doesn't slip out. <laughs> slip out from under you yes, again. again. Yes, again. And then she actually became my wife three years later. But in between, when now she re uh, learned that I was also this trans techno what, DJ, and she actually loved the music. And so we went, we had a wonderful partying life <laughs> for the first three years that we were dating. And then we got married, and it still con continued. And at about 2009, I was drinking also heavily at this stage. Um, and when I was drinking, I became a person that's uncontrollable. And in 2009, there were these Mighty Men conferences. Uh -huh. And that little voice? voice in the back said, you should go. So I said to my wife, okay. I'm going to go. Let's see, I think I must get my life back on track. So I went, but I went on my own. Actually, at this stage, what happened was, when I met my wife, her parents and she, they went to church on Sundays. So I started attending a little bit church more on those days, and then eventually... When we got married, we got married in her church, which is the Reformed Church. And that led up to where I had to decide that I, I had to get a, a, my relationship back with, God, with Jesus, with God. So the next year, I, said, I went again to one of these, these conferences, and I took some of my friends and family with. <coughs> so when we got back from this second time, the meeting the next year, we decided we're going to start a church group, our own church group. Me and my wife were going to church on Sundays at this stage already. We went to a non-denominational church, um, charismatic. And then on Wednesdays, we had this group that got together. So at these meetings on Wednesdays, we were watching quite a variety of material on conspiracies, on the Sabbath, on who the Antichrist is, and so on. And I remember we had one DVD that handled the Sabbath, and I was quite convinced. And I said to my wife, this is very good material, and so if it should be the Saturday, I don't have a problem with it. If the Bible says so, then that's, that's the way it should be. Along with this DVD and material that we saw about the Sabbath, there was also another ministry called Authority in Christ Ministry. And they had a DVD on the Ten Commandments that were still applicable. Uh -huh. So we actually studied this one. But this, DVD, this ministry said, that although the Sabbath is on the Saturday, you don't need to adhere to it strictly. You can still go to church on Sundays, worship on Sunday, or any day for that matter. But as far as it's in your capacity, you can keep the Sabbath and refrain from work. Do it, make it an enjoyable day. So this is the route that we actually started to follow a little bit more. I actually took the Sabbath DVD 
one Sunday with to my pastor and handed it to him. And he said to me, um, is it from the Seventh-day Adventist? I said, I don't know, but the material is very good. I would like you to tell me what you think about it. And he said, oh, no, it's, uh, if it's on the Sabbath, we can worship on any day. And so we left it there. That was in 2010. Fast forward four years. Me and my wife were living on the farm again. In the meantime, my uncle, my dad's brother, and his family started going to church with me and my wife uh -huh. on Sundays at this charismatic church. But now there was also a family friend that started having Bible studies with my uncle. And they invited me and my wife to do these Bible studies with them. But they told us that this family friend was a Seventh-day Adventist. So I said to them, look, the Seventh-day Adventists have got, they say that the Saturday is a Sabbath, which I totally agree with. But that's, as far as it goes, the only th other thing that they want is to get you into their church. So I, I, I'm not interested. So they nagged me for a few months. In the meanwhile, I started studying to disprove everything that the Seventh-day Adventist Church says, except for the Sabbath. And also, their interpretation of the Sabbath, I also wanted to debunk. So I really started digging. Even went to the pastor of our church and discussed some of it with him. And he gave me some answers. And so I started to build up quite a knowledge base of how to... Counteract Adventist doctrine. Yes. I actually still have a, a notebook where I've written all of this down. So we were ready to go and have these Bible studies. And you were going to be the adversary. <laughs> now I must just add that I wasn't always a very calm person. Uh, what do you mean past tense? <laughs> As far as I know, you're still not a very calm person. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're, no, I had a very bad temper, a feisty temper. Well, it wasn't a controlled one, but it, let's put it like that. And um, I enjoyed getting into an argument. So everybody was on pins and needles for this first Bible study that we were going to get together. But the Lord prepared my whole life me for this first Bible study. And that I only realized after it, afterwards, later. Because everywhere there was some point in my life and in our studies up till then that he touched on in that first Bible study, only one Bible study. And the main point was when he started to show us in Daniel who the Antichrist was. Like I mentioned, we were already studying a lot of these material, but it was from different, different sources. sources. And now it started to get together here, and it made sense. So that's why I couldn't argue. Actually, we were agreeing on a lot of things. And that made me think. And so we said, okay, we'll come back for the next Bible study. But I think, if I remember correctly, on the f that evening, he, the family friend invited us to a seminar that would be presented by an ex-Catholic because he now saw that I really found this Bible study interesting. So he invited us to this, but we weren't interested at all. Now, just to backtrack a little bit, when we had that group that we gathered and we watched all this, that material, there was one DVD that I watched, and it was on my computer, actually, and I showed it to almost everybody that I came in contact with, was um, a DVD by the name of um, Islamic Connection. 
and I was watching this DVD quite often, showing it to everybody. And then I decided after this first Bible study, now I have to show this DVD to my uncle and his family. So we went the Sunday to our church, and lo and behold, the sermon was about the laws in the Bible and how it has been nailed to the cross. I was very optimistic and thought now I had a lot of ammunition to, in the second Bible study, debunk everything that they, they want to. So you now had the weapons, and, now and off you went. I even went to the pastor after the sermon after, and asked him if the Ten Commandments also were part of these laws nailed to the cross. And he said, absolutely. And so we got back from church. We watched the Islamic Connection DVD, and I was intrigued about it again and was fired up. We have to study more on this subject. And the Monday evening, that was a Sunday. The Monday evening, <clears throat> we got back from work. Me and my wife, we were lying in bed, and I was interested in finding out more about who this person was that presented this lecture. And I was on Google, and I saw, wait a minute, this guy is a, a South African. I thought he was an American. And I saw, oh, his name is Walter Fight. I said, okay. And suddenly... Something told me to ask this family friend who was doing the Bible studies who this person was that was going to give the lecture at the church. Uh -huh. So I asked my wife, what's up, his wife? And ask her. <laughs> and ask her. And so she came back, no, it's Walter Fight. And I said, no, we have to go. We'll be there next, the next evening. And we were working about 145 kilometers from where this venue was. And it was peak traffic. We worked until quarter past five of the evenings. And the lecture started at seven o'clock. And this was already the second night, the Tuesday, because the Monday, the lectures already started. So we were driving on the Tuesday. And as we got to about 60 kilometers from the venue, it was already way past seven. So we decided this is not going to work. So we wanted to turn around. And just as we started to turn around, the phone rang. The family friend phones. I said, we, uh, where are we? So we're turning around. We are too late. He said, no, 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 come. We, I'm just ahead of you. I'm also late. Now, my wife wasn't very happy because she was already not too keen to go anymore because it's late and everything. It was winter. So we decided, okay, let's do it. Drove through, but we got there at about quarter past eight. So we just caught about a half an hour of the first lecture. But in that first lecture, all the questions that we had for that evening were answered. So we decided, okay, we'll come back for the next one the next evening. Yeah. We drove about 10 kilometers from work. Yeah, the car's overheating. This was not at all something that should happen. It's unusual. And I said to my wife, it looks like something's trying to prohibit us from going to these lectures. We'll drive this car, through, put in some water, and we would say, We'll drive it, and the Lord will have to, to help us on this one. Again, arrived about 20 minutes before the lecture was passed, got the answers we needed. Next evening, drove on the highway. Now we're trying to get a quicker route. On the highway, at the toll gate, don't want to take my card. We had to do a U-turn on the highway. So every night, something, something was trying to prevent us from getting there. And we realized this. And eventually we went to all the lectures. 
and the Friday evening when we arrived. This is the first evening we arrived on time. It's a beautiful night, or it was the sun, sun was setting. We were early because we got off earlier from work and everything. And now my wife doesn't want to get out of the car. <laughs> so I said, what's going on now? No, she said, I'm not getting out of this car. It, it's, the sun is setting. It's Sabbath. And I said, no, what's the problem then? She said, no. If we want to accept this, we can't. Our life has, is going to change. We won't be able to party anymore. We won't be able to have all this brides and friends and all this. I'm not getting out. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sitting there and I'm saying, sure. But isn't this worldly things? Eventually, we got out of the car. Oh, so she finally got out. She got out. And she also said, look at these people. They look so happy. <laughs> I don't want to get out of this car. <laughs> and I said to her, let's go in the air. Maybe this is the Holy Spirit working. And the next day was the Sabbath, the last lecture. And we were driving through again. So we were living, like I said, we were living 145 kilometers. So this is 300 kilometers a day that we were driving the whole, every night and every day. There was one issue that was still bugging me. And that was what happens to you after you die. And I said to my wife, okay, you, you drive. I am going to just read a little bit Bible. And I came to John 14. I don't know. This is, this is how the Holy Spirit leads. And it says, I go to prepare a place for you. And, and when I, I go, go, I'll come back. I'll come back again, yes. To take you where I am. And I read it, and I read it, and I read it. And I said, say to my wife, what does this tell you? And I read it to her. And she was driving and said, that's it. Well, that says to me, you can't go to heaven right after you die. And I said, that's exactly what it's saying to me. And that settled that part for me. Maybe some people have a lot of different things to throw at you, but that settled it for me at that stage. Uh -huh. And so that started our journey. That was in, in the winter of 2015. Now, you attended a charismatic church. Did you speak in tongues? No, but what happened there, around Pentecost, they always have a week of Bible studies that you can do to learn the um, gift of the Spirit. And we attended that. We just never got the gift of speaking in tongues. And so... This bothered us a little bit, but they said, okay, now you must just have pick up your relationship and do deeper study, pray, pray, and you will receive it. And uh, when did you find out that uh, it could actually be a problematic subject? Only when we started studying the fundamental beliefs of the church, and also I went through total onslaught. That's why, like I mentioned in the previous WhatsApp prof, that I've got a lot of sympathy for people that speak in tongues because I grew up in this church my whole life. And um, I think it is quite difficult for them to realize that it, the, the way they think this gift is given by the Holy Spirit when it's not so, it can be hard. But from what we've gone through, look, we, we had to change every single view that we had about everything. But you have a choice. And you don't just do it blindly. We never did any of the choices that we did blindly. It sounds now they are, okay, we went to these four or five meetings um, that you held and Whoop, the uh, light went on. No, it wasn't that easy. I only mentioned 
the questions that I had for that evening were answered. Not all questions. It took a lot of deep Bible study. And I'd never studied then. This is also important to know. As soon as we finished the seminar, I didn't go and take, or both of us didn't go and take DVDs and study them. We went to the Bible. I really started studying all the, fu the fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church for myself in the Bible. I didn't use other preachers to tell me what it said. Especially, I, re I remember very clearly the 70 weeks prophecy. I studied it and then in every, because it, bug it, it, it bugged me. Okay, but the calendar has changed. So how can it be still a prophecy if you use the Julian or the Jew Jewish calendar and all of these different calendars? And I had to study out for myself and every time you come to the same conclusion. And that made me 100. So that's why when somebody wants to argue on the 70 weeks, it's not about somebody else telling me, I really studied it out for myself in the Bible. And that made a big difference. Because the Bible started to come alive a lot more than it used to in my whole life. So you say that you were very fond of your partying and you were very fond of your drinking. And your wife realized that if you continue down this road, something's going to give. So the Holy Spirit was already telling you there's something wrong with this lifestyle. Oh yeah, definitely. So when did you finally decide that your lifestyle has to change? The Lord also prepared me in a way for everything that was about to come unto us when we were hit with the truths of the Bible. I made a promise to God that I would stop drinking if he would help me secure a job because it wasn't going very well with us at that stage. We came out of a bad business um, transactions. And within a week, I had three interviews and I secured anyone I could choose between three different jobs. So you had three interviews and you chose the one that you wanted and you thank God and you stopped drinking, right? <laughs> I thank God, but I didn't stop uh, drinking. Uh huh. And it wasn't, that was in August. The next year, January, I fell sick. Very sick. And this was right in between where I didn't have any medical insurance. And I thought I was going to die. And eventually it turned out, because I went to doctors and they said, no, I've got bad kidney infection. And I've got bad um, urinary tract infection and all this type of things. And they gave him medicine antibiotics it didn't get better eventually it came out that i had very bad kidney stones that were blocking and everything in it okay so a long story short i had to get surgery in the end and while i was recovering i d realized maybe i should now stop maybe this was just the lord's way of telling me you had your chance, don't blow it. Okay, so was this before the lectures that you attended? Or yes. After? Oh, so you were already on the road. And but some, your diet, did that have to change? Uh, yes. I'm, uh, amazingly, what happened was I couldn't drink any coffee, any caffeine for that matter, any energy drinks. As soon as I drank anything like that, my kidney would kill me. The same with a lot of these things. Alcohol, forget it. I, I actually, okay, what happened was I, I, I decided, okay, if I were, could remember correctly, I think I made the deal with God that I only drink red wine. <laughs> no other alcohol. The worst one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And whenever I drank that, yeah, this kidney would kill me. Anything that was not 
helpful or that in the least. So eventually I started drinking uh, decaf coffee. And after about two months, even the decaffeinated coffee, my kidney would kill me. I couldn't sleep at night. And whenever I didn't, there was no, I didn't have any problem. And so this started. But another thing that happened in that same time, I used to play TV games. Since the first TV games came on the market, we had TV games right from I was about 10 years old right through till that, that time. And I was sick. And then whenever I had a fever most of the time because of this kidney. And whenever I felt a little bit better, I would go and sit and play some TV games. Yeah. Within minutes, I wanted to die. And eventually I started realizing I can't play the TV games. And I actually went to my cousin, I remember it very vividly, and I said to them, we'll have to sell all our TV games. We can't play this nonsense anymore. Well, every, all these violent TV games, you know, like shooting games. So you think it's because of your adrenaline rush that you had I, this kidney pain or whatever? I had no idea, but because we were going to church and all this, I thought this was a message from God telling us, get rid of this nonsense. So that prepared me. And when we started doing these Bibles, and this was all before we were doing the, any of these Bible studies. Now we have to get to a very important part. Alan White. That must have been a bone of contention. You know what? <laughs> it was interesting. I had a discussion with somebody, and they were telling me, ah, when we were speaking about the Saturday Sabbath and the Adventist Church, and we want to become. They said, all, you know, all they do is they, they worship Alan White. And I can clearly remember, I said, who's Alan White? <laughs> I don't know who this person is. And they said, no, don't worry, you'll see. It's, the, it's all her doctrines that the church follow, and that's what it's based upon. And I said, okay, but I, nothing from what I've studied the 70 weeks, not one of these studies have I heard, ever heard of her, and I got all the things that I studied out of the Bible. All the answers, the state of the dead, all of this, 100%, and it's not uh, that I watched sermons, I did the Bible study on my own. and I, So this was not, I couldn't understand what was going on. And so the Alan White issue was a bit prob problematic for me, because I didn't, study any of her materials and then I asked the family friend and he also didn't actually study any of her materials and like I said previously none of the decisions that I made or anything that I studied and I any of her material studied all the things that I got out of the Bible and eventually I started reading one or two of her books and the rest is history I will encourage any person that has a beef with Ellen White to read one of her books absolutely pick up Desire of Ages pick up The Great Controversy pick up Patriarchs and Prophets and read it and after you've read it make your decision then I yes, can't make she doesn't dictate the Bible the Bible dictates what she says I, and I've said it time and again because there's a lot of contention about her. If you have a contention with her, you haven't read one of her books. Don't go and read a statement here and a statement there and something that somebody else tells you and, oh, but she's got an obelisk on a grave. I'm sorry. And, the, and besides the drinking and all of that, the rest of the lifestyle issue? After we... The Lord must have been very prevalent in helping us in this whole thing because it just fell away. It just fell away. But it was hard because friendships got ruined. Because the first time we got um, baptized in November, and we usually <laughs> I was the one organizing the New, Year, New Year's parties. And this specific year, 
we didn't even go to one. And everybody was asking us where we, why aren't we coming and everything. And, we say, and I, I had to straight up say. I see. So that put an end to that little celebration. You know, this whole issue of celebration is such a, a bone of contention. I mean, it's not just the New Year that falls away. There are other festivals that Christianity keeps, mm. you know, like Christmas, Christmas you. and Easter and Easter bunnies and all of this stuff. And uh, what was your reaction towards all of that? Christmas was a big thing in our family. We were, in, we were quite a, a, a knit family and my wife's family as well. So Christmas is <laughs> still a big issue there. Um, yes, when I was younger, I used to be actually Christmas father. Oh, I you used to dress up. up? I used to dress up. Since I was, I think I was about 15 years old, I put up, they were decorating myself and I, I loved playing Christmas father. Actually, we already studied that in our home group and saw that th that is totally against what the Bible actually teaches. Yeah, it's a pagan festival. It's a pagan festival. Everything about that is pagan. And I also watched, there is a very um, good sermon, you uh, a lecture you did on that one in Total Onslaught. I'll put up one of those, those links. But there's a lot of good material that you can study on it. So we were never celebrating Christmas at that stage anymore. So yeah, Christmas was no longer an issue. Easter, no longer an issue. It's not that we don't recognize that God came to this earth for us. But not on that particular day, of course. Exactly. Now, um, obviously, once you start making decisions like this, it causes a lot of debate in the family, right? Mm. And not everybody was probably overly charmed that you started keeping the Sabbath and uh, changing your views on, on health and death and all of these issues. So how did the family, the rest of the family, take, take this? Well, it was really a, a bone of contention. And um, up until the point it still is, we, out of the, our family, on um, that uncle that, I, that we, we had the Bible study with, him and his wife and his two children eventually, along with me and my wife, got baptized on the same day into the Seventh-day Adventist church. But the rest of the family, uh, they, some of them probably still think we're mad, <laughs> not... Um, and oh, I have a lot of discussions with them. And uh, it's something that somebody has to make up for themselves. My advice is do the study for yourself. Don't listen to what your preacher or your anybody that you trust even say about anything of these doctrines or studying and i think that's a good point to reassert again the word of god is written not only for a certain class yeah. that is why there was such a war such a war over the word of god and the reformation made it it its task to put the word of god into every hand so that everybody would have access to it. And even when the people were illiterate, they tied the Bibles to the pulpits so that nobody would steal them. And they would have readers to read mm -hmm. the scripture in those early days. The Bible is the great handbook of truth. And it is the Bible that must say what is right mm. and what is wrong. And this is what also eventually convinced me. Prophecy is the one that convinced me that the Bible must be a supernatural book. Because how do you write history in advance? Mm. Uh, 
then the rest was more difficult. You know, I was an evolutionist. But in the final analysis, once you develop a trust in the Word of God, all the questions that you have get answered one by one. And once you start believing the Bible and then finding the evidence to corroborate the Bible, then the Bible becomes very precious. Mm -hmm. And the Bible then becomes the great cleaver. Yes. Everything that you get thrown at you or that you have to Whatever you it is, go through that. Your answer must come from the word of God. You cannot say so and so said. No. No. You cannot even say Ellen White said. No, because who is Ellen White? Who is Ellen White? You can only say the Bible said. Yes. Now, once you've established that what Ellen White says is in perfect harmony with what the Bible says, then you can start quoting yes. that as well. Exactly. But you start off with the Bible. the Bible. And I'm glad you said that is where your basis started. With everything, every time I read Ellen White, I still go, you, you'll, whenever you read a book of hers, she the whole time quotes the Bible. Yes. So keep your Bible with you, next to you. In fact, once you start reading her and you read the verse in the Bible again, it just jumps out at you and has so many new dimensions to it. Yeah that uh, it is like a magnifying glass, Definitely. right? So, yes, I'm convinced as you are that the Bible is the standard for everything in life. And the Bible is the ultimate standard of truth. Mm. And where the world differs from the Bible, it's not the Bible that's in error, it's the world that hasn't grasped the length and the depth and the breadth of what is written yeah. there. That's true. And just to make it clear, not one of the decisions that we had to make was easy. And ridicule on every side. I mean, your whole world turns upside down. And people think that it's just a phase or maybe a, a passing phase. A passing. Let me be, make it very clear. Without God, there's no way you'll do those changes. No, you won't. It has to be the help of the Holy Spirit changing you from the inside along with your willingness to be changed. Yes, that's what it's all about. And that's also important because when we eventually were baptized and became Adventists and started this walk, it's also not easy inside of the church. We really, you, you, it's the onslaught of the devil is huge on well, all sides. Well, it says in the spirit of prophecy, there will never come a time when the hellish shadow of Satan is not cast toward your path. Yeah. Now, Martin, you attended some of my lectures, as you said, but there were many people in those lectures, so I never really noticed you or knew you after that. And uh, the first time I saw you again was when you suddenly were at Amazing Discoveries. <laughs> now, that's a long story that I don't think you, we have time to go into. And... It's very fascinating to me that not having really known this young man at all, suddenly we were thrown into a position where he's sitting right next to me here. Yeah. Didn't know him from a bar of soap. <laughs> Didn't know how he thinks, what he does. And uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't in any way involved in any of this. No, it wasn't planned. No, nothing was planned. Then, then all of a sudden, the lockdown came. Mm. And in that period, with all these things happening and nobody can move, we were sort of moved into a closer walk together. And here you are, and we are both talking about these issues. And what is amazing to me, 
I never ever gave a personal Bible study to you. And yet, whether it is a question of lifestyle, whether it is a question of doctrine, whether it is a question of the spirit of prophecy, or any other theological issue, I find it amazing that God can so arrange the circumstances and the minds of people that even though we are totally different people, we have exactly the same faith, exactly the same beliefs, exactly the same goals. And that is not humanly possible. That, that is how I understand when God said, Acha Jesus said that we may be one, yes. like him and the Father are one. That doesn't mean that our personalities no. are the same. That doesn't mean that our personalities merge or anything like that. Now, you were telling me about your wife that said she doesn't want to get out of that car. Let's just end with that. How did she eventually come around to accepting everything? Because uh, when I look at her... I see the exact same wavelength. How did that come about? Also, studying the Bible. And what happened was, she also, like me, got a certain verse that opened up a lot of her understanding on this, where I didn't have so much a problem about the Sabbath, but more on the state of the dead. She was a little bit more stuck on the, on the Sabbath. And she had a verse, 1 John 2, verse 7, that says, It's not a new commandment that I give to you, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. Uh -huh. And that just opened the whole issue for issue her. For her. Yeah. And she accepted it and embraced it. And so God works with the individual mind. I oh. didn't have any, anything to do with her making a choice. And the same happened to me. And in many, many instances, my wife was actually ahead of me on many issues where I was perhaps ahead on other issues. And eventually they dovetail. And I still remember in our life that the parents-in-law accused her of being <laughs> indoctrinated yes. by me. Yes, we had this. Well, they never said it in, with to us, but I could get the the vibe yes. that they were thinking I'm influencing her. Yes, and that's, that's why sometimes I always say to her, just go and visit or tell and, and tell people your story that they don't think I absolutely. was the one that influenced you. Well, there was an occasion where my wife by circumstances, went to my parents-in-law for a week without me. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, there was quite a distance between us. And they grilled her and hammered her. <laughs> this was their great opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> and to their utter surprise, they realized that this was not my faith. This was her faith. Yeah. And uh, she could not be moved. Mm. So... When the Holy Spirit works, he works through the Word of God. And the rest comes with the package. And eventually, if it's all in harmony and you incorporate it in your life, it's very liberating. Well, thank you for your story. I think we must thank God that he still works with hearts and minds wherever you are in the world. And the great standard is this book. This book, the Holy Word of God, and this is the great standard whereby all issues must be judged. Shall we close in prayer? Thank you. Heavenly Father, once again we want to thank you for calling people to the throne of grace. What a privilege to know that we who are so undeserving and as all humanity is in the same boat, 
we can all come to this point of realization that our salvation lies outside of us and that the God who became a man in order to pay the price for us has never changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And his gospel of salvation has never changed. Thank you for raising up a movement that sets these doctrinal issues in right settings and harmonize them with the entire history of humanity and the Word of God. Bless the listeners, bless each and every one of us as we study the Word to come into unity of the Spirit is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe, click here. When the bell appears, click again to get notifications. To watch the next video, click here. Thank you.